Uh, I'd like to call this public hearing to order. Um, good evening, everybody. I'd ask if anybody has not signed in uh, out of the uh, audience, if you please sign in. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, Historic District Commission. Uh, we have Virginia Adams, uh, Eileen Bornstein, uh, Priscilla Pola, and Greg Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> All Italian, I took over the names. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ken to uh, introduce the people from Cartierian. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is uh, Kenneth Margolin. I'm an attorney with office of 246 Walnut Street in Newton, and I'm here to represent Criterion Child Enrichment Inc. on its application uh, tonight before you. And uh, let me first introduce who's here from Criterion. This is uh, Dr. Robert Littleton, the uh, president of Criterion. Uh, Jack Sullivan, engineer, Mark Maxwell, architect, and Dan uh, Cowett, the COO of Criterion. Uh, uh, the main presentation is going to be presented by uh, Mark Maxwell, the architect. But before uh, Mark gets going, I'd like to give an overview of some of the points that I hope will be emphasized. And also want to give you an idea of why we think that this application uh, merits and indeed requires uh, approval. First of all, I, 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 wanna, I, I want to remind the, the commission members that we're here about historic preservation. And there's two, there are two historic structures on this lot. There's a historic house and there's a historic barn. And one of the things I learned, and I'm sure you on the commission know this much better than I, if you're historians, uh, historic structures are not preserved for the long term by magic. They require upkeep, they require often restoration, and they require a, an owner, a buyer, with the ability and the funds to maintain and preserve. And Criterion's intent to buy this property and put its program for, uh, an early intervention program for infants and toddlers uh, with developmental disabilities represents what I hope the Commission will agree is a rare, if not a one-of-a-kind opportunity to preserve the house and the barn for the long term. A criterion, and this is a rough estimate, certainly could change uh, when work actually gets started, but Criterion will spend, expects to spend somewhere in the range of $200,000 uh, to restore and preserve the historic house it expects to spend a, a similar amount, again, a rough estimate, uh, to stabilize the historic barn. That barn, if a, a considerable amount of money is not put into it, that barn is gone. Sooner or later, it's going to have to be demolished, uh, whether by time and age or an order of a, of a fire commission or a building inspector. But uh, so that I, I start off by saying these two structures are going to be preserved for generations to come because of Criterion's intention to spend the money to do so. All of the historic features, the exterior historic features of the house and the barn will be preserved. Now, I want to discuss the, the addition for a moment. Uh, as you know, there's an existing addition. I, I hope we don't forget that. There is an addition currently on the historic house. The new one will be larger, and uh, as, as you saw in the affidavit of, of Dr. Littleton that you had before you that was part of the, our submission, the addition is the minimum size that uh, criteria needs for programmatic and financial purposes. They didn't make up the size willy-nilly. But, uh, and, and I think, that's, I think that's important because, as you know, Criterion's use is, is here as a matter of right. And I don't think it's, it's really fair to look at the size of the entire proposal as if it was a house. It is a non-residential use which has a right to be here. So for example, the church within the historic district, which is a non-residential use as of right, uh, is much bigger than a Criterion's proposal will be. But there's something else about the addition and, and the whole proposal, and I'm not sure if people are aware of this, and, and this is attributable to the very good work by Mark Maxwell, and he's going to uh, show you uh, uh, a map 
in a chat which he took from the assessor's office. <clears throat> when the whole proposal, when we look at it as in terms of percentage coverage of the lot, of the 24 properties in the historic district, Criterion's property will rank number 10. Now, these are residences for the most part, except for the church. So that means that there are nine uh, structures in the historic district whose percentage of lot coverage is less than Criterion's. There are 14 that are greater. So even when we take into account that this is a non-residential use by statutory right, its lot coverage percentage uh, is, is not at all large for the district, even if you may believe that it was a residence. Um, <clears throat> now, a, a minor matter, uh, unless it's important to the commission, we did try, and I say we, I mean uh, Mac Maxwell and, and his architecture, architects group, tried to see if there was any way to shrink the, uh, the addition a little, even a little bit. And he played with trying, you know, there's a, as, as he'll show, there's a, a walkway or a breezeway between the historic house and the, the new addition. There's one, I guess, now also. Um, he tried to shrink it four feet. That did not work architecturally, and he can explain why. He did say that it could be shrunk two feet. Now that's not Criterion's first choice, but if it's something that, that this commission thinks would make a difference, because of course that would shrink the entire house in addition by two feet, it's something that Criteria would, would willingly do. Um, it, it, the trade-off is it, it brings the addition a little bit, that two feet closer to the historic house. But that's something that can be done architecturally and that Criterion is, is willing to do. Um, I'm going to turn it over in a moment to Mike Maxwell, but uh, one last thing, you know, per, per your regulations of the West Street Historic District, I think it's regulation uh, paragraph five. If this commission thinks it will be helpful, we would welcome the uh, uh, chance for an informal back and forth before a vote is taken. You may not feel that is necessary, um, but we would certainly welcome it. Uh, we did, of course, apply for a certificate of hardship if necessary. I'm hoping we never get there. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, but I want to end my remarks <coughs> as I started. Because of Criterion's intentions for the property <coughs> and its financial ability, this is a rare opportunity to save the exterior historic features of the historic house and to save the historic barn for future generations. I have the head cold that everyone has, so I'll stay away. I, I know you're used to me being able to project, but I'm not going to do so well this evening. Um, and John Williams from my office is helping as well this evening and has been working on uh, the project throughout. Criterion Child Enrichment, which is renovate the existing historic house and construct an addition to the property located at 186 190 Summer Avenue to provide family education, training, and support for children and families in need of such programs. We believe our proposal is in keeping with the Summer Street Historic District guidelines and is an appropriate response to the existing house and barn, as well as the surrounding neighborhood in design and detailing of the proposed renovation and addition. It is our intention to respect the historic character of the existing house and barn and to be sensitive in our exterior renovation of the period materials and detailing. A survey of the immediate neighborhood, as well as information readily available from the Town of Reading Assessor's website, suggests that the completed renovation and addition are within neighborhood norms for lot coverage, height, bulk of the new addition, and the completed assemblage of buildings. We propose to renovate the existing house for administrative functions of the Criterion Reading Early Learning Center to stabilize the barn for future reuse for educational storage. Our proposal is to construct a 5,620 square foot, two-story addition, so that's 2,860 square feet on a floor, in place of the existing shed and breezeway to contain the early learning classrooms and ancillary spaces required for the program. We believe this is the least amount of building necessary to provide the program under regulations and best practices. <coughs> Each floor containing two educational spaces, hallway, egress stairs, toddler and adult toilet rooms, and small spaces required for operation and safety of the educational program. 
Mechanical equipment will be located in the basement under half of the proposed addition, and a small two-story breezeway will replace the existing breezeway that connects the historic house to the addition. At the Commission's request, we have constructed a model of the of this site and, and the proposed addition, and the graphic representations we're going to show you are all uh, from the submission and the application for the Certificate of Appropriateness that we've given you. We must note the poor conditions of the existing house and barn. Um, some of these photographs you've seen, and if you've been to the house, um, of the deteriorated wood siding and trim, window sashes, mutton storm windows, paint and flashing. The slate roof is in deteriorating condition, as is the cupola, siding, windows, and wood trim. There are large areas of the barn that are sheathed only in tie par weather wrap with no siding at all, missing in deteriorate windows. The presence of lead paint and asbestos requires remediation to standards more stringent than normal due to the childcare aspect of the early learning program. We propose replacement of original materials deemed too far deteriorated to be effectively or efficiently saved, and we're cognizant that those elements visible from the public way are of the most relevance to the Commission's review and approval. We've tried to structure the next few minutes in terms of your own guidelines so that we were sure to hit those things um, that we believe are important to historic preservation and to the, to the district. We propose to maintain the historic house, porch, cupola, barn in their original positions. Criterion will undertake extensive repair of the existing deteriorated architectural elements, including the historic brackets, porch elements, balustrade columns, cupola, clapboard, and slate roof of the house. Where replacement of components are required on the historic house and barn, natural materials will be used, clapboard, wood trim, slate shingles, wood windows and sashes, and historic glass. The proposed <coughs> additions exhibits a simplicity of design, a simple rectangle, two stories behind a two and a half story house with a gable and shed roof, comprising 2,860 square feet per floor. We are replicating the window proportions and the six over six sashes to match the historic house window configuration. The existing house, the proposed addition, and the barn, the six over six windows, the six over six windows, the very regular modulation of the windows, the same in both. The historic barn facade won't be changed as the front of the house will not be changed. The character of the buildings, we know these are the, the original house and the barn is Italianate. Uh, we propose to maintain the existing materials and details to the extent practical. Significant rehabilitation and repair is required of the exterior of the house, including remediation of extensive lead paint and a small amount of asbestos found in the hazardous materials. Survey we conducted in January of 2015. We intend to utilize historic materials where we can and replace materials where required, matching old materials in composition, design, color, texture where possible. Lot coverage. This is the now no longer proposed, but the Summer Avenue Local Historic District is outlined. And what we've done is we've taken all of the properties and using information that's on the assessor's map and the property cards, we've calculated the lot coverage and the, uh, the ground area of the house. Our completed structure will be 9.6% lot coverage. So that's the building area to the lot size, and we're including the barn in that calculation. This is very much in keeping with the neighborhood. Our proposed lot coverage places this project in the mid middle of the surrounding existing lot coverage. So what we have is two columns here. This is simply numerical, um, the Summer Street, Woburn Temple Street properties, in the district and abutting our property. And we've used the existing for all the properties except our own where we've used the proposed at 9.6. And as you can see, the, the low end of lot coverage is 4% and the <coughs> high end of the residential is 17% at 167 summer. 
The Unitarian Church is 42% lot coverage. And if we consider the Parker School, which is adjoining the 186, and another protected use like the church and educational uses, uh, that's the Parker School is 20% lot coverage. The, the median lot coverage is 11% for the entire district, and the mean is 12.5%. Our proposal falls in the middle of that range, and if we don't consider the school or the Unitarian Church, then the, the mean is 10%, and we're lower than that, and the median is 1.1%. Not 1.1, 1 .1, sorry. 11.1. 11.1. 11 11 11.1%. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is the 186 Summer Avenue parcel is 71,438 square feet. It's over 1.6 acres. And so that's why our lot coverage is in keeping. We have sufficient land to create this relationship. The massing in bulk. John, do you want to go back to the, uh, uh, or the rendering? We've tucked the addition in behind the existing house as much as possible, given the zoning setback of 30 feet for this non, if you'll go to the site plan for a moment, for this non-residential use, we have a 30-foot setback. So your zoning bylaw exaggerates the setback from 15 in the S15 district feet required on that side yard. Uh, it, we're, we have a 30-foot setback, and we're respecting that setback. We've lowered the ridge of the addition to 32 feet 4 to be 2 feet lower than the existing house at 34 4 and we've limited ourselves to two stories in a predominantly two and a half story neighborhood. The proportions. We've endeavored to ma maintain the proportions of the existing house and barn uh, with our rectangular shape of the barn and farm structures replicated uh, in our new addition. The proportions of the six over six windows, uh, the gable and shed roofs are reminiscent of the barn and the house and borrow the front facing gables on the addition similar to the barn and the house and the front of the house uh, in the gable and design. Our addition follows the guidelines established by the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties and that the addition references the historic structures without replicating them. The shape and proportion is reminiscent of the historic structures. We propose to use composite clapboard siding, double hung windows, generally symmetrical facade. The trim and detail of the new structure will be more simple than the original to let the original stand out and make our addition subservient visually. We will use corner boards and more simplified window trim, again to let the historic house stand proud and draw the viewer's attention. Our intention is to create a modest addition in keeping with the original structures, clearly identifiable as contemporary to the historic house and barn. We propose to retain and replicate the historic detailing as conditions permit. Uh, much of the, uh, John, if you go back to the photographs of the existing house, much of the existing wood ornamentation is significantly deteriorated. Um, and and what paint remains tested positive for lead paint. Similarly, the window trim and surround storm windows and window sashes are in deteriorated condition. It is our intention to remediate the lead paint and asbestos glazing buddy to the windows and sashes and decorative elements, repair and paint, and reinstall the architectural trim and ornament to the historic house. Materials. Much of the clabbered is deteriorated in, uh, with underlying decay, stripped of paint by wear and weather. We intend to strip and repair the clapboard siding where the underlying materials are in sound condition and replace in kind with natural materials where the clapboard and trim of the existing house is deteriorated, where new paint on old material would not yield a sound and lasting protection and lifespan for the renovated structure. We will repair and selectively replace deteriorated exterior materials including the clapboard, wood trim, windows, slate, and architectural details, including the cupola, brackets, columns, railings, stabilize the exterior enclosure and appearance systems. If you'll go back to the um, uh, front elevation, John. 
Oh, sure. Yes. Um, we, have, we will make accessibility modifications uh, <coughs> to the existing entry ports as well as a full handicap accessible uh, ramp entry to the new addition. Uh, there's a short ramp. We'll have to add a short ramp. It's hard to see it here. But the existing house doorway, which is here, will have a ramp that will get you up to the porch. And then we'll need another small ramp and landing to get from the porch at its existing level to the first floor level of the house. It is as common with older homes. It's eight inches up from the uh, porch to the threshold of the house. We will install previously removed gutters and downspouts to protect the house and the porches. The new addition, uh, John, if you can go to the existing elevation or photograph, either one. <laughs> So this is two-story breezeway and shed is what we're removing. It comprises a footprint of 860 square feet. So when we talk about our 2,860 square foot addition, you have to subtract, when you think about what we're adding to the site, the 860 square feet of that. The shed and breezeway are not original to the period of or construction of the house or barn. There's, it's clear from the construction techniques, foundation, design, and detailing. We believe that when adding new structures to old, the new should be sympathetic in materials and patterns and should stand clearly as distinct from the historic fabric. The entire property of the new and the old must blend harmoniously into a complete composition. We are proposing composite clabbered siding with a five inch exposure on the classroom addition to match the house. Double hung windows with simulated divided light, PVC windows that are proportionally similar to the original house, but more simple in their trim and detailing. Window trim, corner boards, water table, and fascias will be cellular PVC in width similar to the existing house. The addition's roof will be composite architectural shingles to match the recently re-roofed barn, while the historic house slate roof will be repaired and reflashed as necessary. The connector and the school entry will be clearly differentiated in new construction, comprised of an aluminum storefront with a rear-facing flat roof. This is the storefront area. So clabbered, clabbered, double hung, double hung. This link replaces the existing connector and is really meant to be very transparent and to disappear. We'll use an existing EDPM uh, roof membrane on that flat roof. Uh, and the school entry will have a small projecting canopy over the front doors. Our architectural design will create a new structure respectful of the historic, while practical and handsome on the property, constructed of modern materials for quality and longevity. Character. We believe our proposal is in keeping with the surrounding neighborhood in terms of height, mass, and bulk of the proposed building in conjunction with the historic structures. An analysis of the surrounding homes and institutions in the Summer Avenue Historic District identifies similar two to two and a half stories um, as our two and a half story house with the two story additions, shed roofs, gable ends. There are in fact some three story buildings in the, in the neighborhood. Site context. The site plan of our project has been approved by CPDC and includes a single curb cut. John, you wanna to go to the site? plan. So we have a single curb cut at the front of the property, the driveway leading to the parking areas with the bulk of the parking in the rear, nearest the Parker School parking lot. Site engineering has been developed by Jack Sullivan, who's with us this evening of Sullivan Engineering Group, in coordination with the town engineer, and has also been approved by CPDC. Traditional vert vertical granite curbing will surround asphalt paving, walks and ramps to the primary school entrance will be broom finished concrete. The ramp and stairs to the historic house will be wood with painted wood handrails and guardrails. All ramps and stairs to the house and school will be barrier free to meet the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board guidelines required for such facilities, as well as being most convenient for the parents with strollers, which are Criterion's primary users. Spatial relationship. <laughs> We've referenced the connected house and barn 
to the building relationship in, in our proposed composition. This is a very traditional relationship in New England and in historic context, which is the connected house and barn. Uh, the, the property immediately to the north of 186 is an example of that, where the house, the barn, and the outbuilding appear to have been connected. We've created a general description of the materials we intend to use on each of the three components. It's quite lengthy. If you'd like me to read it, I will do so. Um, we've, we've talked about many of these things, but it does go piece by piece through. And if you'd like that, I can go ahead and do that, uh, read that. Um, and a few other points, and then you can decide whether you want me to read that list or not. Uh, some of the components that would be viewed from the public way. The exterior HVAC equipment. John, I don't know if you can point out these two locations for me. But we'll have two locations for the compressors. One is tucked behind the existing house, behind the addition, and the other is behind the addition, tucked between the barn and the addition. Proposed plantings will, will further obscure this equipment from view. The exterior lighting fixtures, um, we've worked through this with the CPDC. Um, we have um, printouts of those fixtures, but we've pro provided <coughs> light fixtures that are in keeping with the historic set setting, energy efficient, and will all be timed, uh, tied to a time clock calibrated for the actual hours of operation and the, a safe period for users to depart from the building. The fencing, we're using fencing along the, um, John's trying to figure out if I can point to the plan or show the fence. Go ahead and show the fence and then we'll, we'll show where it is on the. So the fence is made up of four feet of solid. This will be stained wood at the bottom and then 12 inches of an open lattice work at the top. The whole construction is six feet tall as dictated by zoning. And it basically extends, if you'll go to the site plan, John's got the pointer there. Um, so we've got between the addition and the property to the north, we've got fence that extends to that position. We've got fencing around the dumpster. Uh, they're required by, there are two dumpsters required by CPDC, one for trash and one for recycling. And then along the front of the property, this uh, <coughs> landscape plan may even show it better, but we're, we're, um, we're limited in the front. We, we have no fencing in the front of the property. It's all on the side in the rears of the property. And so we're limited by the tree cover, the existing trees on the south side. We'll take the fence to the first major tree that we're maintaining. And then it goes around and goes all the way back to the school property. Then it starts back at the top again at the school property and comes around to protect the bulk of our addition from the neighbor to the north. We've minimized the site walls. I know at one time we were talking about the site walls. The only retaining wall we now have is around the stair from the mechanical room in the basement. So that would be six inches of lip and essentially no retaining wall. In part, uh, Jack has helped us to get out of needing uh, any retaining walls for the changes in grade. The pathways and drives are indicated on the drawings and the site engineering has been approved by CPDC. Uh, the exterior stairs seen from the public way will be wooden, wooden handrails painted to match the house trim. The historic balustrade and columns of the front porch will be maintained. Uh, we've, we've talked about the roofing. The roofing proposed for the new addition will be high quality composite architectural shingles uh, and, and architectural in nature and charcoal gray to match the relatively new ones on the barn. Uh, the siding will be repaired with wood materials on the existing house and barn, and then a high quality cement resin clapboard to match the texture, exposure, and color of the existing house. We have a small trellis on the north side. On the rear of the building, where this trellis exists, uh, inside is where we have our lift between the floors. So we have essentially, we have a small elevator and that shaft is right between there. Uh, one of the things we've done over the last couple of months is increase the number of windows and the regularity of the windows on the back of the property, on the 
uh, facing to the north here. Uh, the windows, we will maintain the existing windows of the historic house and barn, sash, lintels, sills, architrave, and glass, and other decorative elements to the extent possible. We plan to install new aluminum storm windows on the exterior to replace the significantly repaired deteriorated wood and glass storm windows and to improve energy efficiency. The masonry, we will preserve the old granite foundation materials uh, and, and uh, there's some stone and brick as well on the foundation of the barn. They'll be stabilized, repaired, and repointed as necessary for structural integrity. We intend to save whatever old granite we can from the foundation under the breezeway. We believe that original house granite was turned out when that breezeway was added, and we want to, we'll use that um, in all of the places that are visible uh, from the exterior. Um, to the extent that we can, we believe there's enough there. New materials will replicate old without trying to match identically, and the new addition will be identifiable to highlight the dignity of the original structure. The new materials will match the old in physical properties, design, color, and texture. Um, as Mr. Margolin said, uh, we, we believe that we can shorten the connector by about two feet and, and there's two issues, John, if you go around to the front, yeah. There's two issues with shortening the connector. <coughs> One is that the collision of the eave of the historic house with the gable end of the new addition, that they're only about six feet apart right now because both have a significant overhang. And so when we pull these together, this space, which is just a little over six feet, is getting tighter and tighter. The other issue we have is the need for the connector as the second egress from the house and the classroom building. And so we have a series of doorways that require that connector to have a certain amount of distance between it. And we've calculated that about 10 feet from side to side is about as, uh, as close as we can go. And John's showing you that connector and how these doors are starting to overlap each other. <coughs> We've added additional windows, as I said, on the back and enlarged those windows <coughs> on the north side, and we've lowered the ridge and the roof. What we've done, if you'll go back, is we've, this is an eight and 12 pitch, eight and 12 pitch. We've kept the eight and 12 pitch on the gable ends, and we've made the main roof of the addition shallower to a seven and 12 pitch to bring that ridge down. So, um, I go back to, um, we can either present you with this um, listing of uh, what we're going to do, but it really just documents what I've described to you. And, it, and it's rather repetitious because we're using the same materials on the house and the barn, and we've described the materials on the addition and how we believe they're complementary. Mr. Blodgett, what, what is your preference? Because we're happy to give it to you. So we're, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, we can bring the model forward, and we can go uh, back into <coughs> any of these exhibits that you'd like. And one, one other point I'd like to make, and if we, sorry, we need to uh, give you paper copies, we will. But we also want to make sure that those uh, lot coverage uh, chats and our map are part of the submission. Yes, we yes. think those are important. We, we did not bring physical samples. I know we did not request it, but okay. it would have been but we, good. We can do that. We'd be happy to do that. Any other questions? We'll have, we'll have a regular time. Yes. Sure. Um, I'll start for a minute here, sure. and then uh, let me see if I can. Um, um, let me just read the purpose of the bylaw. Um, the purpose of the bylaw is to promote the economic, educational, cultural, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Reading through the preservation and protection of the distinctive characteristics and architecture of buildings and places significant in the history of the town of Reading, maintaining and improving of the setting of these buildings and places, and the encouragement of building design compatible to the buildings existing in the area. 
so as to maintain the historic character of residence and commercial in, uh, enterprise, which distinguishes the town as a desirable community. Um, at this particular point, what I'd like to do is open it up to the public here. Um, and reading the overview of the architectural significance. Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm going to have Ginny read the uh, overview of the architectural significance, and then we'll open it up to the public um, to have their input. Um, understanding what the bylaw 7.3 7, uh, 7 is about. It's predominantly about architecture and um, the buildings and visibility from the public right away. And because that's the material that the committee will be deciding upon um, in terms of that. So let's have a, uh, the overview of the, uh, the property. Architecturally, this house and barn is of high style Italian and eight design, built in 1853. It carries many features of the Italian eight style with its elongated windows on the first floor, and all windows are emphasized by shouldered architraves that are appropriately defined with contrasting paint colors. The classic veranda uh, exhibits pierced Gothic columns, and the cupola carries the same Gothic influence. A prominent exterior chimney is decorated with terracotta rosettes. Paired brackets at the eaves and gables are the hallmark of the Italianate style. The side pergola is a later addition, as is the connecting unit to a modest two-story structure. The barn emulates the high-style house with its own distinctive features. The center entrance is embellished with a central gable pavilion along with paired doors that have the same feature of the shouldered architrave of the house. A pair of semicircular windows complete the barn's distinctive architecture. Historically, several prominent families have lived under the slate roof of 186 Summer Ave. It was built for Robert Kemp after he bought land from his business partner, John Mansfield. Mansfield built the house next door at number 176 about the same time. The two men commuted to Boston, operating a boot and shoe manufacturing company, and resided in Reading as neighbors. Robert Kemp formed an amateur touring musical group named Father Kemp's Old Folks that took many Reading residents far from their hometown. The troop went to England in 1861. Kemp sold the house in 1868 moving back to Boston, but returned to Reading and built a new home at number 199 10 years later. Williams Hawes was the next owner. He, like Kemp, was a Boston businessman who started a dollar store, which was the second one in the country. I'm not sure it has any relationship to the dollar stores. <laughs> <with them. laughs> Jacob W. Roberts came to Reading in 1880 and bought the property. A number of Robert families lived on Summer Ave. Jacob's son, Arthur E., built number 194. Other Robert's homes were numbers 141, 149, and 159. By 1910, the property was in the hands of Dr. Herbert and Emily Howard. He was the director and supervisor of Massachusetts General Hospital. When he died, his widow offered the house to their son, Charles Howard, and she continued to live in the house with him and his wife, Catherine. Charles Howard's life was spent in public service. He was a state senator, a treasurer of Middlesex County, and on several commissions. Locally, he served on the board of selectmen, the town moderator, and town council. His wife, Catherine Graham Howard, wrote a book entitled, With My Shoes Off, recounting her experiences as secretary of the 1952 Republican Na National Convention, along with her role as deputy commissioner general to the Brussels International Exposition in 1958. 186 Summer Ave is considered a keystone in the neighborhood that now holds the designation of the Summer Avenue Historic District. Thank you, Jane. It struck me that a dollar store probably then was probably a hundred dollar store now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with uh, that in mind, I'd like to open it to the public. They're free to ask, uh, have comments and ask questions of both the um, historic district. Uh, I would ask that all questions come through the chair and we'll try and spread them out to whoever can 
discuss giving the answer. Uh, but most of all, it's most important to have your input. <coughs> Yes. Um, Kelly Clark, we're 99 Summer Avenue. Um, and you're the next uh, gave you some good uh, time to make our house fabulous. <coughs> and um, my question, uh, my first question is, so with this public hearing tonight, what are the likely outcomes um, as part of the bylaws and part of the procedures that we're going through? Uh, this is an application for um, appropriateness. Um, there are several, I guess it's okay to talk, but it's, it's all available public knowledge. Um, that it can be approved. Uh, there can be some criteria put under that approval. Um, obviously an agreement with criteria. Uh, it can be disapproved uh, at that particular point. Um, there also can be the uh, capability of moving into what they call a hardship, um, which falls under financial and other characteristics. Um, again, that could be a certificate of hardship or it could be disapproved. Um, that's, those are the most obvious, I think, at this particular point. Did I miss anything on that? Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Nancy Baxter, Bill Street. Can you talk a little bit or have you talked a little bit about parking, parking restrictions? How is that being set up? That can be answered, but I would point out that it's not in the, it's under the, the domain of the CPDC. Okay. okay. But it's still mm -hmm. legitimate, I think, to I was I was going to um, I apologize every time I stand up getting mean. Uh, I, I was going to you anticipated my comment. Uh, we vetted the packing uh, a great deal for the CPDC. I don't think it's within the province of, of this historic district commission. Yes, ma'am. Um, Kelly Clark, can I have a name, please? Oh, Nancy Black. Um, 15 Orchard Park Drive. Um, I, I noticed that the, the view of the addition that we're looking at here um, replicates the, uh, um, I don't know, what are those, gable roofs? Um, but when you show the back side, it's basically a straight wall with some windows. There's no detail on it. It just kind of looks like an, an office uh, addition. And I wondered what the reasoning was behind that, because I would think that you would want the addition, whether you're coming either way on Summer Ave, to, to have some rich architectural detail. I'll turn that over to the architect. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, if you'll, Jonathan, go to the back side. The, uh, in fact, go to the site plan for a moment. That will actually help us, I think. Uh, landscape plan would be better. I'm sorry. Uh, if the, the primary view to the property is from the south looking north, and that's the image that, that you said we responded to the gable end, the, if we, I'm, I'm trying to think, go to the, um, to the chart of the sizes of the properties, the lot coverage, and blow up right in our area there. So, essentially, the addition is being put in this position, and there's less view there. Now, if you'll go to the landscaping, um, the house sits forward in that position, and we're tucked a little bit behind it, and you can zoom out. Um, so, we're going to plant the back of it. It is more simple, but many of the houses, if I, um, and if you look at many of the houses where they're connected, they are agrarian structures, they're garages, they're barns, and they don't always have a lot of fenestration. We didn't want this to look like an apartment building across the back. Well, to me, that's what the back of that house looks like, without any, there's, there's nothing. And if I'm driving in that direction, I am going to see that part of the house. Yes, and, and, and some of that view over time and immediately will be obscured by some of the plantings. And the we, we've dressed up the front as the front so it's identifiable. And we tried to keep the bulk of the building down in the back. We at one time had dormers on the back and we had been asking the 
design and review process how we could make the building smaller, and one of the ways was to take those gables off the back side. They also don't serve the same purpose to us. The ones in the front, we actually are making use of the space. In the back, it's utilitarian space, and there would be no use for it. So it would simply be building more attic space and making the building bigger. So in the move to bring it down to two stories, this is one of the, one of the methods that we used. Questions, yes ma'am. The original house, the addition in the barn, looks so large and congested because that's really on one original lot because this whole lot was actually three lots. So when you look at it from the street or especially from any angle really, it's very congested and very large on a small, in a small area. And the other two lots are for parking. And that's the three lots. And one of them is in the back. So for the setting of the neighborhood, it visually, it doesn't fit in. When you look at the house, two houses to the south of this property, it's a behemoth. And that should really be clear that this is three lots changed to one, and that when you're doing those comparison on those numbers with percentages with the, compared to the other properties. I have a question, a few comments and questions, but is it possible, I haven't had a chance to see that, to move the, um, is it possible to move that to this table so more people might be able to see it? Um, I think it was Mr. Margolin who spoke first, and he was talking about um, historic preservation and the historic preservation of building and structure, but within a historic district, we're not just talking about historic preservation of individual buildings and structures. We're really talking about historic preservation of a streetscape. And so I'd, I'd like to address that and how this fits in with the neighborhood, not just the preservation of the individual buildings, but the whole, the, the whole, um, the whole structure together, and, and I completely agree that this is, um, the addition is 52 or 56? 5620. 5620. And what is, what is the size of the original house? Does anyone know what the, the square footage is for the original house? Off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I started, I didn't add them up. I was doing a lot of work on the assessor's database, too. But it's about 24. Is that the house and the existing two-story workshop, two-story workshop market? Pardon me? No, so if you're talking maybe 8,000, and I don't know what's being taken off. Do you, do you know what the total? Yeah, sorry. 36 is the house, and they're taking off like four or something. And the barn is 1,200. Okay, but I'm not, but the barn isn't connected to this. I'm just talking about yeah. the original structure. So it's a 5,600 and 3,600 original house, and you're taking off about, it'll be just under 860. Okay, so 36 The existing minus. house is 3,669, finished living area. Uh, the extension, which is to be demolished, is 210, and the shed, which is to be demolished, or proposed to be demolished, is 480. Uh, that would leave 2979 under the building. Okay, so we're talking about a structure that is give or take 8,500 square feet. 8,500. 8,599. Okay, 8,599. So not talking about lot coverage, because we've heard a lot about lot coverage, but I wonder where 8579 fits in a, stru a structure, because they are connected, and you're talking about it as an addition. It, it is a house originally, and all houses have additions. They have additions organically. 
But I'm wondering how many, uh, how many additions um, in this neighborhood and how many additions are put on that are one and a half times the original size of the house. And so I wonder how that is in keeping with the streetscape and the historic nature of it. Because it really, it really, you know, when you talk about lot coverage, we're not talking about two separate homes on two separate lots. We're talking about one 8,500 plus square foot building, a, a part of the barn, I'm just talking about the, the main structure, one 8,500 <coughs> foot building. And how does that size fit in to this historic neighborhood? And I would say that it really does, that the massing of it, the massing of a structure, a single structure that is 8,500 square feet is not in keeping. I also think that you need to take into consideration the view. I mean, there are some buildings that, um, so I did go looking on the assessors. There are some lot sizes that seem to be up to um, 0.8 acres and 3,000 you know, square foot houses, some smaller houses on 26,000 square feet. But when you're talking, when you're when you're when you're looking at Summer Avenue, and when you're when you're looking at it, and when you're moving through that space, you have buildings <coughs> and green space, and buildings and green space, and that is the streetscape, and that's the purpose of a historic district. It's not just preserving an individual building, and I'm I'm grateful that the buildings are going to be preserved. I am grateful to that. And I'm grateful if the care is being taken to preserve them with historic materials and, and to do that. Um, I don't know how sympathetic visually the building is with the original structure. Um, I think because it is so much larger than the original structure that, you know, what is, um, what is the dominant building on this property, certainly, or the dominant features, really changes the whole, the whole landscape of it. Um, I, I don't know how, I, I don't know what restrictions can be put on with regards to size, but in my view, the, an addition that is 5,600 square feet that is one and a half times the original building that creates a single mass of 8,500 8, square feet is not <coughs> sympathetic with the neighborhood and does um, really change the character of the neighborhood and completely disrupts the rhythm of the streetscape. Um, and, and as far as a historic setting goes, it isn't just individual <coughs> buildings. It is setting, it is um, streetscape, not individual buildings. So um, I, I would not be in favor of this project as it is. Mr. Thank you. I will like to respond. I will wait till everybody has spoken. I have a response or comment. It's up to you. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, if, if and I, before we're done, I'm going to make uh, discuss some legal principles that I think are important here, which I only touched upon very briefly in my opening comments, but I, I will return to them at the end. But in terms of restricting the size, if this commission restricts the size, it is effectively denying the application because Criterion cannot uh, operate its program. And I'll address what I think are the legal implications of that at the end. Other comments from the board? Neil Anthony, Roger Parker, we're out in full force, it seems. <laughs> uh, I just want to ask uh, for clarification <coughs> from the uh, commission. You have jurisdiction over what you can see from the street, is that correct? Visible from a public way. From a public way. So on this property, exactly what do you have? I know 
you have the front. So how far do you have jurisdiction on both sides? Is your travel <coughs> east, or east or west on Summer Ave? In my perspective is the east side, the sunrise side of the house, um, you do not see. It's the back. It's the back side parallel to Summer Ave. But because of the large open lot on the right, as you look at the building, most of the south side of that building is entirely visible. And if you move to the north side of the building, okay. Get better off talking. I'm coming down Summer Avenue out from Uber. From so, Uber. From Uber. I'm going from down towards yes. the wall. Then so if coming from Uber, as you would find this. That's the south side, right? Yes. yes. You're on the, it's on your right is 186. And what you'd be looking at on the, is the front of the house would be the west of the house. Okay. And the south would be the, right. so you see what the you'd side see. of the house. Yeah. Gotcha. And then if you went past the house, if you look back, you'd see the north side of the house. Right. And there's quite a bit of visibility here also because um, the other house next door, um, Drake's, I believe, Bob, and St. Louis Brothers. Uh, it's a large lot, but the house sits a little bit on the left side again. Both of the houses seem to sit on the left side. So there's quite a bit of visibility. You know, there's corners you can't see in behind and stuff like that. Okay, so, so that's the visibility point of view. Okay, so that's sweet. Okay, so with an addition being added to a historic house coming from the north or the south, how much jurisdiction do you have over what that should look like? Talking about this addition. Well, except for a small. <coughs> uh, we can consider massing, scale, and uh, visual appearance. Uh, we ha do have limitations as to specific things that we cannot review, such as <coughs> we don't have jurisdiction over the gutters or the driveways or things like that. It's all clearly delineated in the um, bylaw. So you do have jurisdiction over what this addition looks like. Yes. I know the, I, I've seen it with our new, <coughs> new library. There seems to be this architectural feeling out there, which I don't agree with, that you take a historic building and you want, you're not going, what the piece you're putting on it is gonna be modern. It's not gonna look like our old library. It looks like a sore thumb, this, and I, I mean, we're doing this library, but I was sorry to see what they did to it. But I went to a school in, in Pennsylvania for college, and we had the nice Georgian brick building. We were back a couple years ago, and there were huge additions on them. And the most amazing thing is, you couldn't tell they were an addition. They still looked like beautiful Georgian well, I, I feel the same. I, I, I heard your comment, Mr. Architect, about how you don't want to take away from this building, this beautiful Italianate building, so you're going to put on this more modern building. Camille? Can I address that? Well, do you mind? No, no, I'm no, sorry. 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 No, I just, I, I just really want to say that I cannot believe we would put that type of an addition on a beautiful historical home. And I don't, I just, to me, that completely bastardizes the house. So that's my comment. I guess I'll make a couple of comments just because I feel like making a couple of comments. Um, the chair recognizes the chair at this particular point. Um, the philosophy changes, not just from generation, from period to period. And in the world of being um, historic and historians, um, I don't put myself there except for having a lot of love for history, and people know that I do that. It has changed in the 19, I know that many of the crowd has heard this, in the 1960s, 65 to be exact, when uh, Richard Curtis supervised the building of the addition on Parker Tavern for the caretaker department, it was to make it look as much like it could as possible. And I'm telling you, you've got people walk up there and they can't tell the original building from the addition. 
So that's a, that's the problem that that presents. So what they try and do, well, I'm, I'm not any architect at all, is they try and make something that there are compatibilities and points, and there's a wide range of that. So the library might be a little bit more modern than this, but basically that's the reason for that. Um, that's where that's coming from. That's that doesn't settle the fact of what you like or don't like. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Edward, um, part of the reason the addition doesn't look exactly like the original structure is because the historic commission in Virginia was at the meeting. They asked that it not look identical to the original house so it wouldn't be confused that it was an original structure. And so, Camille, as much as you may not like it, I was at the meetings when they asked these architects to make sure it was sim <coughs> similar to but definitely not identical to, so people could tell what was original and what was addition. That didn't come out of nowhere. That came out of the request of the That's historic true. commission, so we've already been through those steps. Okay. Uh, you're quite right. Um, the Secretary of Interior standards is what um, most preservationists use now, um, and one of their standards is that any new additions to historic structures should be able to stand on their own and not replicate, which the um, architect said that the, this is not replicating. Um, if you go back to when we connected the town, how, um, the town hall and the library, they were going to put a brick addition linking the two buildings. And at that time, um, again, the Historical Commission spoke up and said, the guidelines state make it look like an addition, which it is. So, um, you know, that worked out fine. And uh, it's important, it's very hard for the general public who doesn't work within these um, parameters to understand visually that they should be standing on their own and have their own merits. Um, the architect might be able to go more on that. But. I, I, I think you described it accurately and typically when we put an addition on a building we try not to follow the exact shape and size the same ridge height and that sort of thing so that it's clear that it is an addition and that you can see there's a certain honesty about the original historic structure and a little bit of separation <coughs> and identifiable addition i just had a question about the protocol of this meeting and where people should address your comments i think it's to you yes, A, how many parking spaces are there being proposed? And B, why is it thought that parking is not relevant to your jurisdiction? I can answer the one about jurisdiction because we don't think take the historical nature doesn't take into the ground level. Um, that falls under the <coughs> CPDC. Um, and do I, can I need to say more than that? I think it's... Um, yeah. okay. Yes. No, we don't, we don't do zoning, and there's a little conflict within our bylaw, and I'm being very honest about this right now. <coughs> it's one place it kind of says in the bylaw that you don't do it, but in the guidelines it kind of says you do do it. And so it gets into the thing, is it, is it a structure? You know, and uh, so basically we've stayed away from driveways, and uh, I'm not sure that we should, but, uh, but we haven't had any questions. We haven't dealt with it at this particular point anyway. Mr. Chambers? Yes. Sure. Um, the, the entire structure of the language of the uh, Historic District Bylaw, Town of Reading, the Historic District Act, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40C, goes to structures. Structures in their setting, yes, but structures. And in fact, in your uh, guidelines, explicitly exempt are terraces, blocks, <coughs> sidewalks or similar structures, it, it, it would be an enormous stretch, and I think too much of a stretch, for this commission to take jurisdiction of packing spaces, and not to mention uh, to duplicate you know, the CPDC's work, which was very extensive, and clearly within their jurisdiction. So I think, I think the language of the 
the act, the bylaw, and the guidelines uh, support the exclusion of parking spaces. <coughs> well, as I said, there is a conflict between the bylaw and the guidelines. It, it's a, a case of constructed materials and whether they're at ground level or above ground level and stuff like that presents a little bit of a problem because they're considered a structure and we, we deal with structures. So there is a little bit of conflict there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think it's important that the commission hear what some of us in the audience are saying and understanding that there's this school of thought in, in the way that buildings are designed today that it shouldn't replicate the original structure. But I think what you're hearing from some of us in the audience is that this particular structure doesn't work visually for us. It doesn't fit it to us. It doesn't fit in with the original structure. And, and I guess, you know, I, I, I don't know what the alternative would be. But um, when I look at this structure, it, 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 um, it, to me, it is, has a negative impact on the original historic structure. So, and, and here's a picky little thing. What is that walkway that's going between the old house and the new house? Is it like a glass walkway with metal? Mm -hmm. Is that it? I, I mean, that just seems Um, and this question, could we go back to the design? I, un if I understand it, or my question is really this, how far afield can you go from the original architecture in the, to, to the new addition? For instance, can you put in principle a modern steel and glass extension onto a federal or a Georgian style building? How f what is the practical uh, differentiation that you can go? I don't have a tab answer for it, but I'm telling you a lot of people have, a, there's a wide range of what can go on. Down by the VA hospital uh, in um, Bedford, there's a, what I would call a Victorian, and they have the most unbelievable glass structure. I can't even visualize it right now, but uh, the, the addition that went on, well, that will go under our library has a, a wider scope. Uh, the addition, I think, that went under the Methuen Library probably 30 years ago, has a much wider scope um, because they can't replicate brick and stone and castle structure like the part of the tenure of the was up there. <coughs> so, or tenure of Searles, I'm not sure which of us uh, up in the film. So th there is a wide range and what's accepted and not accepted by different people is going to differ. Okay? And so I, again, you're invited to express your opinions about that. That's what this meeting is all about to get your opinion said so that the commission can hear them. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Boyd, could you touch on the moon roads to the model in the West Region? Okay, and from time to time, I'll take some different views. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would be somewhere else, heading toward, from moving, toward moving. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. this project showing what it actually looks like, you know, the fence popping up, the yeah. addition, the walkway, you're going, do you know what I mean? Does anybody I know what you mean. The, the I'm setting up the picture because I can't do No, that. I know. It's <laughs> very hard for us to look at an architectural drawing. It's not large enough, so if you're actually seeing a 3D rendering of it, also the, the model, do you have the fence that you can bring out and stick on there so we can see and not much attention is being said about the fence. There's going to be a fence on both sides of the house. Yeah, also, what's the distance between the addition and the barn? The <coughs> barn looks like it's being, you know, just uh, locked by the building. What's the spacing? What about snow and plowing? Is there, a, you know, a driveway going behind the addition and the barn? And the glass structure connecting. What about snow and weight, considering the recent, you know, 
snowfall we had this year. Are there any issues with that? Well, I'm sure those fall under I'm just, I'm just, al also you mentioned a conflict between the guidelines and the bylaws. That might open up an opportunity for a petition I, I, or something. On the one specific area I talked about, the driveway, mm -hmm. and whether it's a structure or not, you know, it's a grade level, and I'm telling you there's a little confusion about that on that very one area that I know of. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Marla Club, Summer Ave. So we're here, but when we're talking history and we're talking about preserving for generations, I guess my question is what happens to a structure this size when Criterion's done with it? opportunity to preserve the structure and the barn. I'm curious how that was determined. And, and I and I say I'm sorry. And I say that because I know of at least two other properties in this district that were purchased and significantly improved upon greater than the $200,000 number that they quoted earlier. So it's not out of the realm of possibility as they seem to make it appear. Sure. Okay. Uh, in fairness to the gentleman, that was not based on scientific evidence. It was based on our common sense of the world. A buyer that comes along to buy what you saw with the, the work needing to be done to spend Four hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars and up does not come along every day, and may never come along. So that was, was, but it was not a scientifically based statement. It's appealing to your common sense as to how the world works, and to the understanding that the bond has a finite lifetime if it's not stabilized. And I've seen, I've had cases here before the case ended. The building inspector, one in the western part of the state, ordered a disputed structure demolished because it became a hazard to firefighters. So that was the genesis of that statement, uh, Mr. Walter. Okay. Yes, ma'am. very sterile and very commercial. It doesn't it doesn't look like it's made in, in any way, shape, or form to, to kind of fit with it. It looks like it's made with, um, and I believe the construction materials and stuff were all composite, things like that, you know, very cheap grade uh, building materials, and I just don't think it, it looks like it's in the keeping with the, the neighborhood as well. Okay. Other questions and comments? Jerry Lamb, 194 Summer Ave. I, I know our town council's here. Where, where do they fall on this gray area with respect to your purview over parking? Does our town council give an opinion? <laughs> or, or the, you're not parking. Can we give them a little bit of a chance? Okay. Now I, I'll, to, I'll have to speak. Yeah. So if there's a conflict between the bylaw and the guidelines, we have to go with the bylaw because it, um, something that was adopted by town meeting. Um, the bylaw has a set of exclusions, 7391, uh, and one of those exclusions is terraces, walks, driveways, sidewalks, and similar st structures, provided that any such structure is substantially at grade level. So um, I think that clearly uh, applies to the driveway, and I think it also applies to the So those things are excluded from the um, by, from the purview of the <coughs> historic district commission, according to the bylaw. Um, there's a pretty large sign uh, in front of the um, proposed project. Um, does that uh, material and the size um, fit within the purview of the committee ever? Um, and then one thing. The, uh, I 
can't quote it exactly, but roughly the sign is limited by the by what has to be written by the size of the letters. And that really is a problem. Because if your letters are this small, the sign might be this big if you've got that many words. But if your letters are this big, you're going to need a point. You know, it's not really a good answer, but I can't. <coughs> very little jurisdiction. So one of the things that had come up at a previous meeting with the clergy here, but I'm not sure if you were there, was that there was a request to actually put the sign on the structure so it wasn't so obvious in the street seats. And I just wanted to throw that out for your committee consideration because potentially we consider that when we um, adjust the appendix to the point. Yeah, that's a good Other questions and comments? No, I don't think it's worth your part. Yeah. Does the sign bylaw, or does our town's sign bylaw, that's for businesses only? Or does it, does it work within a juris, uh, residential neighborhood? I made the mistake of asking the assistant director of community services that. Um, it's, it's, he may have an easy answer for it, but I don't know. Okay, so the, well, two part answer. Part one is that the, the sign <coughs> bylaw is part of our zoning bylaw, and it does indeed apply in all districts, and it has, um, and has various, various restrictions. Um, um, the historic district bylaw 7328 refers to exterior architectural features. One of those features is signs. So I would say that this, uh, the Historic District Commission has jurisdiction over signs as well. Knowing, having, having worked with the sign bylaw and knowing all the issues that have been caused, yes. oh, it, there's been many headaches over our sign bylaw. It, and, and I don't know if this is a question that whether the developer, or the purchaser, or whether <coughs> you, but it seems like somebody should be following through as to <coughs> what the parameters are for, because I have a feeling this is going to be a relatively new case. We have dentists and around town, and they'll have a small sign that you know there's a dentist here. There's one on Woodman Street, actually, and there's a sign. But um, that's going to be very interesting. And it may not be as easy as, as one might think it would be to get it permitted. Mr. The, uh, the sign was actually, the sign, the size and the location of the sign was actually an issue before the CPDC and uh, Criterion made adjustments at the request, as I recall, of the CPDC. Uh, and we don't want to get hung up on a sign that needs to be effective, but it was it was an issue that some time was spent on by the CPDC and part of the world. I know it moved from up at the front of the lot to back toward the building. And that's correct. And there, it's approximately four feet. I can't and say. also changed material from being aluminum to being wood. And it meets the front yard, what is considered a monument sign, um, allowable under your zoning code. <coughs> yes? Um, can you please clarify uh, please, in, in Woodman Street, the sign that was um, your purview over setting. Interpretation: It's the setting of the building and the the, um, the 
parameters around that and the uh, aesthetics of the setting of the building. Ings. Um, it's not really a ground level. But then it wouldn't include the elimination of green space and parking at all. All right, green space has not been questioned. I don't know where we fall on that. We've not discussed that. So I'm just saying, so it does not include the parking at all. Well, green space, and, uh, I'm, I'm answering we have not discussed green space. Okay, I'm just, when I think of setting, I'm, I'm thinking of the whole package. And that includes 38 parking spaces. Kathy? Chairman, thank you. Kathy Greenfield, 192 Woodburn Street. Um, I want to go back to discussing the appropriateness of the bulk and the size of the addition, if I may. Um, Criterion presented data um, comparing the lot and building <coughs> size and the sizes in all of the district um, in an attempt to justify the bulk of their oversized facility in our neighborhood. Um, and I have a hard time coming to terms with that rationale. Um, <coughs> and I, I think that the, the size of the facility is at the crux of the issue of appropriateness of this whole thing. Um, we know that 186 summers idyllic historic setting is due in large part to the size of the current structure in relation to the three lots that it sits on, um, that it has always sat on. And as well as its relation um, to the streetscape, especially the view from the public way as you approach from the south, as we mentioned, from Temple Street. I mean, right? That's the money shot. That's the, that's the view that we all think of when we think of this property. Um, I think it's disingenuous to suggest that an 8,600 square foot commercial facility with 39 parking spaces is in any way appropriate in this historic setting. It's, it's not. Um, and yet, the applicant seeks a certificate of appropriateness. They're asking you for a certificate that says you agree that this is appropriate. Um, and there's nothing, in my view, that is suitable or appropriate about the visual impact of this facility in this historic setting. Um, so what is appropriate? I don't know exactly. Um, a, an addition of a, a one, a one and a half stories um, with a smaller footprint and half the parking, is maybe that's appropriate. I don't know exactly. What I do know or recall is that at the CPDC hearing, um, the applicant stated that their facility had uh, twice the square footage required by educational standards for the services they intended to provide. Um, and I don't know what their, their um, claim of hardship is, but I can't imagine it would be a hardship for them to provide those services in a reduced size space. Um, if their intent is to grow their business, I don't think it should be done to the detriment of this neighborhood. Um, I think that the only thing that's appropriate in this space on the square footage of those three lots is a structure that is substantially similar <coughs> in size and scope to what has been there for 160 years. Um, anything else is inappropriate and should be denied. That's my view. I don't think there's any room for compromise on a project proposal that they submit that does not entirely fit in the character of the neighborhood um, and that you are not 100% complete, uh, completely satisfied with. Um, the character of this most intact historic streetscape in all of Reading has been <coughs> entrusted to this commission and I just encourage you to stand firm in your experience and your knowledge of what is historically appropriate and accept nothing less. Um, so obviously the, the, the size of this structure is, you know, the, the focal point <clears throat> tonight. And there was a claim made that the size that is being presented is the minimum that Criterion can use to provide their services. And as I think a lot of people know, they have many other facilities around the state. 
And I'm curious as to the size of those facilities, how that compares to this structure. Do we have that information? I do not. Is that something we could request? To tell you the truth, I don't think it fits under the parameter of us, the visual and the, the bulk and the mass and all the other characteristics. That it was just, yes, it was, it was said as um, an argument as to why they need to be so big. Right, I understand. And therefore, it should be <coughs> included as, a, as an area of, of you know, uh, to look at. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, there was actually a, a discussion of that, and it was uh, it's contained in uh, Dr. Middleton's affidavit. It's actually his affidavit that was in support of the request for reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We won't get there unless we have a problem with this tuition tonight. But um, what Dr. Littleton explained was that, uh, he explained that there's a, uh, uh, a minimum, re minimum requirement, 35 square foot per student, uh, required by state regulations. Those regulations, for some reason, apply to children without disabilities and with, with disabilities. So when you take the extra needs of these children and their disabilities, and those extra needs are uh, places, space for equipment, and, and I, I think uh, we, we sent pictures along with the affidavit in our submission, the type of equipment that would be there, and the, that it, it becomes uh, a square footage, and I forget how many it is, uh, Mark. What's the square footage that criterion uh, applies per student? It, there, it's, me, it's, it's, it's not done as a straight square footage. The, we did the program for this facility before we had a building, and it came up to the size of the structure right. that we're recommending. That, that program being, being the existing program in stone, which is moving to Reading. So these, the size of the classroom was not made up. They were based on Criterion's experience with the program that's moving to uh, Reading and the need for four classrooms. And that dictates, with auxiliary space, the size of the addition. Uh, so if this commission were to say, we'll give you your uh, certificate, but you're going to have to shrink the size of the addition by 20%, you are effectively saying you cannot run your program uh, at this facility, and I still want to address what I think are important legal principles after the public has had a chance to uh, finish their comments. Yes, Mr. Chair, Karen Herrick, I'm nine minutes road, and I'm a town meeting member. Um, if it's okay, uh, with the permission, I have a, an email on the floor on television from a resident who couldn't be here tonight. Would it be okay if I, if I could read it for input on this topic? Okay. Yes, um, sure. Chair will, chair will allow it. Uh, Chairman, um, this is from, as long uh, as they say who it's from. Yeah. Of course, that's the beginning of the letter. Uh, Mr. Richard Wood of 55 Locust Street in Reading. To the committee, unfortunately, I could not be present to voice my opposition to the granting of the certificate of appropriateness, but please consider my opposition to this proposal and enter it into the rec public record. I moved to Reading because Reading is a nice community comprised of a single of single family homes of reasonable sizes on reasonably sized lots. For environmental and livability concern, I do not feel that this is an appropriate project for this area. One thing that I want to note as a new resident of Reading is that before moving here, everyone told me that one of the things they liked most about Reading was the cute single family homes and that they are all different. I feel that many citizens in Reading and those outside of Reading value our historical district and would like to see it preserved as it is. It's truly a gem of Reading. Everyone knows Summer Street. I want to point out that I live in Birch Meadow and I still want this area preserved. I urge you, please preserve the culture of the area and do not grant a certificate of appropriateness. Richard Wood, 55 Local Street. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, over here, sir. Uh, Frank Harper, number 195, somewhere. Uh, I'm just curious, what's the second biggest house in the district? Square foot wise, just the just the structure. You mean residents? Residents, yes. I would believe it would probably be well, it's, it's a little difficult because the the uh, Wisteria house is three stories, so I don't know the square footage on the floor. Wisteria is bigger. 
I think what I live in square feet, maybe. I think it's 46. 46. So this is this is roughly twice as big as the next biggest house on the street. And I just want to echo what was said before that it's just way out of proportion to what and how we live now. I just ruined our whole neighborhood. It's way too big. I just wanted to follow up um, with the comment before about the, the size and, and square footage and whatnot. And the comment about um, this proposed facility is to replace the Stoneham facility that currently exists. Um, do we know the size of the current Stoneham facility? Does anyone know the size of that in this room? Is that something you think we can request that would be material? We don't have a square foot for this, but the Littleton thinks it's at least as big, but we didn't think that was really within the jurisdiction, so we didn't bring it. general um, and I'm referring to uh, the enabling act under which the bylaw was enacted and um, the bylaw tracks the enabling act pretty well um, the provision that was referenced by town council indicates that uh, things such as terraces driveways and sidewalks are considered structures it does not indicate that parking is one of those structures so at the very least, there's an ambiguity in both the statute and the bylaw that could be resolved either way. However, my comment goes on to say that structures, including other buildings, need to be considered by the commission in terms of setting. Uh, that comes from 40C section 5, uh, which uh, indicates that it's incumbent upon the commission to take into account the condition and appearance of the property. Under section seven of 40C, it starts talking about a historic site in the context of a district. It talks about considering the relationship between the structure in this particular case, both the building and the parking, to the land area in which the building and the structure is situated. It goes on to say that the general purpose of this law and the mission that the, the commission is, is, um, is undertaking here is to prevent developments that are incongruous to the historic aspects of the surroundings and of the district. So what I'd like to do is underscore for you that there are some general considerations going to the layout of a large commercial development um, inside of a residential district, all of which is historic. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, just one follow-up with regard to the discussion between whether something should look like a historic building or not a historic building. Uh, I know uh, I've been to the Royal Ontario Museum, very old building with crazy structures. But but whether or not something looks you know looks like something or is drastically different, I think. What I saw and what other people have seen is that it's of no architectural significance and it looks like a very plain commercial building. And that's it. And you go down the street and, and you can see you know, federal buildings and farmhouses and you know, an Italian age and a colonial and they're buildings of distinction. And, and to me, I mean, to call it an addition that is that large, but then I understand the commission asking to not try to match it because you wouldn't want to do that. But still, you can have modern structures that have architectural significance. And, that's, and that really is what this building doesn't have. It's not just that it looks like it or it's distinct from it. It's a <coughs> building that looks like a commercial building and is lacking any significance <coughs> in itself. Uh, 
um, Kelly Corwin went on you and Sunrap. I don't think <clears throat> I made, I had a bunch of administrative questions earlier, but I never um, made my views um, known uh, to you ever to the committee. And I think this um, proposed project um, from a street, streetscapes perspective is not appropriate. Um, uh, given the mass and um, the bulk of the building, and I would um, <coughs> urge you to consider uh, denying the application you have in front of you. Um, I have a statement I just want to read, and I apologize if it's a little bit redundant in some um, areas. Uh, I want to thank the Commission for your dedication to all of your hard work, and this is a difficult. Um, project, and as the proposed buyers of 186 to 190 Summer Ave have certain rights under the antiquated, vague, and often misused Dover Amendment Law, Reading has rights under the Summer Ave LHD to protect this neighborhood. I ask the Commission to execute your power <coughs> and to take this opportunity to assure that this historical neighborhood and the con contribution it makes to the character, integrity, and uniqueness of this town is protected. Please take into consideration the following points. We talk the size and bulk, which we've talked about considerably, the crowding of the original building, a 5,600 square foot new addition and the close proximity and blocking of half the barn from the street view does not fit into the size and scale of the neighborhood regardless of the lot size. And this goes back to my original comment of the, um, this lot is originally was three lots. Um, the copious parking and paved walkways to support this large operation leave little open space. This breaks up the contiguous screen space of the street and that's the commercial feel of this project, affecting the quote unquote setting stated in the bylaw or the guidelines, I forget which one it was. Um, the appropriate use of materials, this should not be dictated by budget constraints. Um, please carefully evaluate the aluminum frame glass connected between the original house in addition, also the um, entrance canopy um, and doors on the new addition have a very um, commercial aesthetic. Finally, if possible, since it is, this is a private property, please consider reducing the size of the stop sign, handicap signs, as well as the no parking signs that we placed along the travel lane within the parking area. I could not find the number of signs that were planned on being placed in the CPD decision. I don't know if you have that information or not. Um, so, thank you. Um, is it possible to <coughs> mention so many things in that that you didn't say coffee? Or sure. Anybody else is also free to uh, come into uh, Dean Deliosis at the community services counter and drop off or email things to there. Uh, we'll pick them up on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. No more questions, no more comments. I, I, that's what this is all about, folks, is have us hear what you want us to hear and to have a chance to talk to everybody about that because we feel we have a, a tough decision to make for several different reasons, okay? Um, so I would like to thank you for coming and participating in this. Uh, and uh, also thank the hearing for coming and the board for the continuous volunteer sacrifice. And Mr. 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 Blodgett, may I make a... Yeah, a and, yes. Um, last chance for comments. <laughs> Kathy? Yeah, I just want to make the um, point that if you're, when you do make your decision, I don't know if it's going to be tonight or if you're going to deliberate another night um, before your, the 60 days runs out. Um, but I've heard some comments from Mr. Margle and that, that, they, um, that they couldn't operate in this space if it were any smaller, that they've, that they've made it the size that it needs to be. And I think that that's an important, going to be an important consideration for the commission. Um, and I, I would like to, uh, or, or I guess I would hope that you would have some validation of that and know what the size of their other facilities are. Um, and things that they said at CPDC, like what the maximum number of students will be there at any given time. It seems like they have, again, twice the space that they need. And I, I think that that's uh, gonna be a very, <coughs> <coughs> they claim hardship. Sorry. Sorry. Everett and Virginia and other members of the board, I want to commend you for having run a tight ship tonight and having uh, dealt with a very challenging topic in an expeditious and polite manner. Good job. Um, with that in mind, I
like to make some comments. Yes. And that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, first of all, administratively, um, and I apologize for not having extra copies. We can certainly provide them by email tomorrow. But this is a, a copy of those material notes that uh, Mr. Maxwell referred to, and that he asked if you wanted them to read, and I'm sure you didn't want. Okay. Uh, and then this is the uh, this was the flaw for the uh, his, the uh, lot percentage map from the assessor's office, okay. and this is the chat and the handwriting is mine and all it does as you can see is it, it lists the number the ranking but doesn't change the content itself we don't have a clean copy but i can get you a clean copy okay not you. Uh, i did want to address uh, in a little bit more detail because town council was here what i believe is the interplay of the dover memo which was very astutely mentioned by a member of the audience and as you know, I did reference in one of the memos that I submitted to this body. And the Dover Amendment, quite simply, uh, gives Criterion, because Criterion is a nonprofit corporation, educational corporation, mm -hmm. under the statute, mm -hmm. and its use will be educational. Criterion has the right to exist in a residential district and has the right to operate its program at 186. 190 Summer Ave. Now, the Historic District Commission also has jurisdiction here. So you have two statutes. And what I suggest, and I'll be very candid, and unless Mr. Meares has found something I did not, I don't think the appellate courts have addressed this, but I did suggest in my memo that the appellate courts, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, has been clear that when you have two statutes operating together, what you try to do is make neither one cancel out the other. And so I do believe that in terms of the size of this addition, and by the way, Dr. Littleton did address the need for the size in his affidavit with, with some specificity. I think that the jurisdiction of this commission with respect to the size is restricted by the Dover Amendment because if you treat this non-residential use, which is allowed by law, as if it was a little house, as somebody said, as if it was a house, you were effectively undercutting another statute which exists alongside yours, the Dover Amendment. And also I would point out that there is a non-residential existing structure in the historic district, and that is the church. And I believe the church, and don't quote me, I got this from Mr. Maxwell, is approximately 15,000 square feet. And that's a more appropriate measure because that is, and, and if the church were coming in today, it would have a right to be here under the Dover Amendment and possibly the legal, but the Dover Amendment. And it would not have to restrict its, its church structure, its, its allowed structure to the size of a house. So we have two laws in effect here. One allows criterion to operate a non-residential program on, in this neighborhood which certainly implies that it can have a non-residential scale. And as we said, we don't think, I, I understand this disagreement, and I respect disagreement, that's what we're here for, but I don't think that the scale is out of proportion when you take into consideration the lot and the existing non-residential structure, the church. Uh, also, I want to respond to some comments that were made. Our big, Criterion's biggest concern is not the way the addition looks. So if, if and, and this would really be something that we would defer to, to you commission members, if you said to us, you can keep the size because we need it, if you said to us, no, make it look more like the existing house, we will do that. But really, that's, that's your call. That's not Criterion's main concern. Criterion architects spent a great deal of time and effort trying to craft something that he thought respected the house. There's disagreement there, and if, if you members say, we'd like you to add more detail or make it look more like the existing house, Criterion will do that, even if it costs more. So we, we put that out there. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we hope we do have that opportunity uh, under your guidelines to your regulations, rather, to have a give and take if, if you members think that will be worthwhile. Okay. Thank you.
with that in mind, I am going to close off the public input, at least for now. And um, I'm going to invite committee members to ask questions if they have a criteria and a response, and we're going to have some need to change. I'm also at some point going to stop, and we've got a couple of regular routine business things that have to take place. Um, so um, basically, uh, I guess that's where we're at right now. You're welcome to stay if you want and listen to whatever happens. Um, but I thank you for your input. The committee thanks you for your input. All right. Um, do we want to um, we're going to start here, I guess, and we're going to ask some questions and go back and forth a little bit and see what happens. Yes. Before you do, can I just get a look at the model? I have a video. Yes. Problem. It's going to be right here. Okay. Thanks.
I will again point that uh, for now the public is going to be closed because we're going to have some exchange in between here. Uh, see if we have questions that we want to get answered, and then we'll see where we move from. Uh, with some legal after that. Eileen? Um, I have a question folks, uh, that you came up with a uh, 5,600 square foot addition, and you said that was based on um, necessary classroom footage. Are those classrooms self-contained? Uh, are the walls permanent walls, or are they movable so that you could adjust the size of them and perhaps diminish the size of the entire structure, which seems to be the big objection? So the the size of the square footage that's dictated by the regulation is exclusive of all the list of ancillary spaces that are also required. So there's somewhat of a misnomer when you say there's 35 square foot of classroom space. That's absolutely clear classroom space and you need a hand washing sink and a toilet and storage and hallways and stairways. And so the, the space, it's, it's always a misnomer to think that the 35 square foot is multiplied by the number of kids, or that you would divide the building by 35, and that's how many kids can be in the building, because that's not, that, that's not a relationship. The, the second part of your question, on the second floor, we do have a folding partition, and, and that's one classroom and the gross motor room, which is where large wheeled toys and things like that are okay. used, and that is part of their therapeutic program. And so um, there are times in the winter where we may open uh, that, partition and use the second floor as a larger space. Uh, and that would allow us to have more kids up there at a time. The program itself for the building was developed before we had a site at all. We looked at, uh, as we have for other locations, to have this many classrooms with this many kids, with parents, at this schedule, how big does the building have to be? And we're right in the ballpark of where we expected to be when we didn't have a building or the constraints of the historic house and barn, or know what we could put in the historic house. So we're using that for the administrative reception uh, and office functions that go with the program. But there's no way to reduce the bulk of this building to make it more amenable for everyone? and still maintain your facilities as needed, but with a little compromise to the bulk of the building. There is not for that. I mean, we, we operate right now with four rooms in the existing location. And how many square feet do you have and there? That, and that, those rooms there are probably even a little bit bigger than the ones we have here in the same size. You know, the basic layout includes you know, one room we use for gross motor educational activities as planned out that we can expand or shrink. Um, you know, we, we have times 
from all of, all of the rooms are in use at the same time. So that kind of precludes us coming down into a smaller size. Um, and you know, we, we have facilities in some cases that are much bigger than these facilities as well. It's based, you know, the number of rooms and so on are based on the number of families served in this general area in relation to the size of the building. In some areas we have a bigger, uh, they have bigger building. In some areas we have a smaller, they have smaller building. It's been sized to meet the needs of this community. Well, I was, I was just thinking that if you made the, the first floor as flexible as the second floor, then you would have literally more flexibility in yeah. you know, wow. various, uh, you know, assignments of people and, and uh, machinery and equipment. I mean, believe me, from our point of view, you know, from a cost point of view, it would be better for us to have no more square foot than we need, especially when we're building part of it that's new. It's just additional cost for us to carry that we not we prefer not to carry, frankly, but we also have to be the size necessary to meet the clinical needs of the community. We did look at one time if we could put classrooms in the bar and attach all of the buildings together, and the structural engineer um, and our code consultant both advised against that, that that would require essentially the bar to be rebuilt from the ground to the sky at this moment um, because to meet seismic regulations for this use. Does the state have any requirements for uh, square footage for children with disabilities and motor problems? The minimum size is that they don't take into consideration for adaptive equipment and so on, which we which we do with population. They don't have separate right. regulations, right? right. That's my point. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. yeah. No. Okay. Yes. discussion to be had on that and please have it. I mean, as long as we get our, our form and function that we need to accomplish our mission for our families, um, uh, we'd, be, we'd be glad to incorporate that again. Okay. Ms. Adams, did you have a question? No. How, ma how many? It's up to you. Yeah. You're your <laughs> judge. To, um, for the record, to say that um, this commission has jurisdiction over this um, hearing uh, because uh, the um, Summer Avenue Historic District was established January 13, uh, 2015. So that's just for the record. And uh, as members of the West Street Historic District Commission, we um, have the oversight of the Summer Avenue. review considerations are based on general principles of design review, um, such as character, harmony, site context, spatial relationship. Um, and I appreciate the fact that A, the historic structures are on site and will remain on site in situ. So that's very good. But <clears throat> we must do whatever we can to reduce the size of this building and 
afraid two feet is not going to make much of a difference. So um, we had talked about different roofs. You didn't come in with any alternatives, though we appreciate the fact that you're saying you could consider other things. Um, it's not perhaps appropriate for us to design it. It might be more appropriate for you to come in with um, other suggestions. Um, also, uh, we need to consider the scale, the height, the massing, the bulk, the setback, the roof, the fenestration, uh, the materials, and the surface treatment. So, um, we have a, some concerns about uh, the materials that will be used on the addition, or let's not call it an addition, <coughs> on the, the new structure. Um, I guess that's all I'll voice at this point. <coughs> Thank you. I have a couple of <coughs> comments, questions. And leading up to this, I read through the bylaw, I read through the guidelines, stuff like that. Um, and I actually mentioned to you at the end of the meeting last time that I thought size was going to be a problem. And I still contend it. I have a difficulty with, a, with the presentation using square footage to represent the size of the building. Because it really doesn't. It represents square footage. Footprint. Um, when you take that footprint and you look at the interior of the building as terms of square footage inside, that really is how big the building is. Um, actually, uh, it's 188.7% larger than the historic building itself, the house itself. It's not one and a half times, it's 1.88 times larger. And that's huge, absolutely huge. <clears throat> and I think part of the difficulty we're going to have and I don't mean to be standing up on the fence, I just don't have too much um, um, When you block the impasse and say we cannot do the service any less, that doesn't give us any room or you any room to negotiate. And that's very, very difficult because we're responsible for the setting of that building, the setting of those buildings in relationship to the other buildings, and it just becomes a massive problem. And it isn't mentioned once in the guidelines. It's probably at least a half a dozen times. Setting is in the purpose. Um, setting up is elsewhere. And so I find it very, very difficult to find with that. So I tried to look at some other things, and I tried to say, what about addition? I put an addition on my house. You can go and look at the addition on my house. It's shingle versus cardboard. So I didn't want to paint all the cardboard. Um, and many people ask me, why did you do that? I like it, but that's fine. Um, I look at the size of the addition, and then I look at the size of the addition on a house just across the street, the Savage House. And then I look at a new addition just down the street on what I call the Lewis's House. And then I looked at the addition that went on the Roberts House, which is very small. And then I tried to think of the additions that are on that section of Summer Ave. Well, mm, even before that, I thought of the additions that went on West Street since we've been up there um, as the district. And one addition, it's a 38% increase in the building by square footage. And it's in the back of the building, so the visibility is very, very low. And then I look at the bylaw that says if it's a less than 70-year house, anything over 25% has to have approval from the board. Anything that's over 70 years old has to have approval for anything on the, on the board. And that presented some problems. I said, kind of, and I haven't figured this out is how to get the average addition which goes on. Not every house has additions. I don't really know how many are in that section of Summer House. Not very many. Um, one down by Wisteria. There are a couple of new houses down in that area. One that wasn't taken into the district because they wiped off the oldest part of the house. Um, and that they took off the oldest part, put an addition on the newest part, and so there was some alteration there. Additions aren't usually that big. They don't even come.
close to that thing. So I have some problems. I have some difficulty with the impasse of saying we have to balance it. And I just find that very, very difficult in, from the spot that it puts us in. And, and, I, and, and perhaps this is, uh, and I don't know if town council does this publicly or confidentially, but I think, I think part of the commission's issue with the size does go to the fact that this is not a residence. And that's why I referred to the church in, in school, because they are quite a bit larger than, than this program. Um, criterion cannot <coughs> put on a new structure as if it was uh, a middle class family of four, because that's not what they're here. And in fact, if they had to do that, if, if they only could, could behave as a residence, uh, then they wouldn't be here, but they have a right to be here, and that is a legal issue. And that's, so, and I guess ultimately, uh, town council decides whether that's an, uh, relevant or not. We think that it is because I understand if we said we're going to make an addition which would suit a family of six, everybody would be happy with it, and we we'd be out of here, but. Criterion is not running a family home for a mother, father, you know, whatever, <laughs> however, family structure, and uh, four or five or ten children. Criterion is running an early intervention program. It's a non-residential program, and so the addition is of a non-residential size. And I think that is a dilemma, and I, I understand it's a real dilemma for some people in the neighborhood that came out today. Maybe a dilemma for, for you, Mr. Blodgett, and the commission, but we urge you to consider that that's criterion is exercising its right to be here as a non-residential use. And that's why the addition is the size that it is. And that's why it's bigger than a family of four or six or eight might put use for an addition. That's an important legal question. Criterion facilities, we have educational storage, both of equipment that goes with the program uh, that may or may not be used every day, and also for records of the students. And it does tend to overrun us at most of the facilities that over time and longevity, <coughs> the program that this is replacing has been operating for 17 years. And so there's a certain legal requirement for record storage and um, the Federal Education Records Protection Act. Uh, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Protection Act. So the rather than that we have to preserve and, and those and, as well as equipment storage. And, and, and so and that's, that's in our calculation that over time we will need the space in the barn for that. The use that we cannot easily put in the barn is the student use, the children and families in that building because that building code, and we're um, as, as we've talked about with this and the other boards and commissions we've met with, we have a number of overlapping set of requirements. Building code, Department of Education, early learning, uh, historic planning, uh, basic building and engineering code. So all of those things are overlapping to us. Uh, and the barn was in the early possibility we, we tried to put two classrooms out there. And again, we were recommended that unless we plan to rebuild the barn from the ground up day one, that we couldn't do that. I don't Mr. Mayor, I don't understand that. Um, it's the condition of the structure. Okay, but it's the, you're, are you saying that the condition of the structure needs to be different if it's a classroom? The new classroom building allows us to build to the current code. The old barn structure does not today. Well, well that's not what I asked. What I asked was, is there a different set of standards in the code <coughs> because it's for classrooms than for other uses? Yes. Can you explain what the, what the differences are? 
It's an I. I'm going to get this wrong. Um, it's an I for use, which is an institutional use when you have children present. Whereas everything else the criterion does is a business use, an E use, an education use. E and B are the same under the building code. All of the institutional uses fall under a different seismic uh, calculation than the educational use does. So we often have this discussion um, with Dr. Littleton's organization about our buildings are always a hybrid of E and I-4. So the educational, the offices, the, the reception space, conference space, all of that is one kind of code. And then where the children are present, from infants to three years old, that is an institutional use and does fall under a more stringent set of requirements. Okay. And what portion of the bond do you think is reserved for future use? I'm sorry, which portion? What, what proportion of the bond do you think is reserved for future use? We plan to use the, the first floor, the main floor of the barn, for storage space. Okay. We'll have to rebuild the foundation to do that. Okay, so the second floor of the barn is... is we won't be using the loft. Just reserved. And what will the future use look like? The barn outside will look exactly as it does today. The future use of the barn, what sort Educational of storage. So you're just going to keep storing on top of... Once we've rebuilt storage. the foundation and the first floor, we will stack within the legal limit. All right. Okay. Um, what is the distance from the um, from the rear of the addition to the front of the barn? I'm sorry. What is the What is the distance from the rear of the addition to 15 the? Fifteen feet. Fifteen feet. Fifteen feet. Okay. The building code allows us to deal with all the structures as a single building, for purposes of a building code. So there isn't a, a requirement of a distance between those buildings. Oh, okay, I got that part. I'm, okay. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, that just seemed to contradict what you were saying before. That they treated the building code treats treat them as separate. Treat, it treats it as a single building. That doesn't mean they are one. But not for the purpose of, of the. Um, um, the uh, the seismic. Uh, Correct. Because we don't have children present in the barn okay. structure. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so, you, and the distance to the um, uh, between the back, the rear of the uh, original house, and and the um, addition is. Did I hear you say it was four feet? No. The distance between the original house and the classroom addition is 12 feet today in our design. It's 12 feet. But they're the connected the by, there is a connector. Okay. Not, not counting the overhead. I'm sorry? Not counting the overhead. Not, not counting the overhead. So 12 feet, and you, or you said you could, you could shorten that by 10. Two feet. By two feet to, tw to 10. discuss what benefit we might get by doing that? It would pull it away from the barn a little further, <coughs> which would make a little bit of the barn more visible, uh, just giving it a little more breathing space. And the detriment is the closer it comes to the, uh, uh, the, the addition to the house, um, the closer those eave lines become, which is what will be apparent from the public way. You're never going to see the building. The way we draw it doesn't really matter whether you do it electronically uh, or build a model or do it 3D. We don't view the world at 180 degrees full on. We do it at an angle. And so the building behind the building, there's, there's much, people think today that the barn is totally free of the house. But in fact, if you stood exactly on the sidewalk in front of the house, the barn is obscured by the house today. And so the closer we bring the addition, the more we obscure that. The further from the barn, the more we make pieces of the barn visible. So it's a relationship that we crowd the house to free up the barn, or we crowd the barn to free up the house. Okay, well, if, and as, as long as we're talking about crowding the barn to free up the house, is there also an option to move the addition closer to the barn? That, that does exist. 
that possibility does exist. There are some great issues and foundation issues. We're trying to stay away from the barn foundation today because it's not in very good condition. It's basically rubble, stone, and brick. It's in poor condition and there's many uh, impromptu um, innovations downstairs to hold the barn up today. Uh, we know we need to stabilize it. That's why we use that term. Um, it's in tough shape. A couple of the uh, commenters uh, today uh, expressed concern about the rear facade of the addition. Um, is there an opportunity to, to improve or look at that? We, uh, no, no. Just, yeah, that was a result of the feedback received from the first run through the original historic group. Historical commission. And, and kind of discussed again at the three meeting here. So okay. that, again, I would put that in the jurisdiction of <coughs> the answer is community yes. one. The answer is yes. I mean, the, the sure ex that's exterior that's appearance, that's the exterior appearance can be <coughs> modified, at, at the, which is a good conclusion. Um, okay, I think, it, I think the comment was, was made over here that it's hard, it's hard for the mission to redesign this. Um, and so one of the options that has been discussed is, is making the building look more like the house, have more, have more of the Italianate features, and you indicated that you'd be willing to do that. How hard would it be for you to give us an example of what that would look like? <coughs> with, with, with the agreement of our client, we can do that. We can add gables to the back end, we can add more trim, we can add more windows, whether they're real or not real. Um, we, we have been striving to have an honest building that doesn't have a window where it's into a shaft and that, that there aren't gables where there's nothing behind it. But we can change the building, we can alter the building if that would make it more palatable. I guess we would want some guidance if that's a, a wish of the commission rather than, because we could come back with 20 different you know, proposals and everybody could say we don't like that one either. So we would need some guidance, but to answer your question directly, yes, the, the appearance can and will be modified if we request the commission. I think the, the trade, there's a trade off here. Obviously, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about a non residential use building of, of a scale that is less than the other non-residential use building in the town, but nevertheless bigger than the residential use building. So I think that kind of puts us in, obviously, an unusual set of circumstances where there's a lot of concern about appearance. And I guess what we're trying to say is it's, it, that if we can come to agreement on function, then the, the appearance side is, is entirely negotiable. And I think it, it does put us in a position, of not inappropriately, but I wouldn't object to the fact that the Historic District Commission is representing the community is helping design the building. I think that's appropriate in this setting. It might be different if we were uh, truly just a residential home in, in a residential neighborhood and we had a right to our own personal taste. But our mission is to serve the community. Our mission is to serve families. And so, you know, from the standpoint of working with society in this regard, we're happy to do it. But what, what we would ask is, Fairness, meaning that, um, it, that if we're going to begin that process, that we deal with the, the basic uh, size question and, and otherwise, and say, you know, let's work on uh, you know, that you have a right to, but let's work on appearance, and then we'd be happy uh, to do that. But um, you know, some things can get resolved okay. first before we know how flexible you, we can be. You've heard a lot of people express concern about. But, bulk of the building. If the building were it were reconfigured to be less distinctive from the house, do you from the professional opinion as an architect, is that um, uh, would that serve to ameliorate some of the massing issues that everybody's um, mentioned? Or do you think it can Can I reinterpret that question? Are you asking specifically whether in the two camps looks same, looks different? Yes. Uh, one uh, is less intrusive in the neighborhood than the other. Is that is that? Well, you mean visually? Well, I'm just trying no. to. Is it would is 
would a change to a more similar design um, <coughs> visually appear less bulky? I do not believe so. In fact, I would give you the example of when you take a colonial house and you add an addition. If I, if I showed you two images, one is the colonial house where we keep the ridge line, we keep the wall, we keep the windows the same, we simply bulk up in width. And then I show you another one where the same footprint addition is brought in two feet from the front and the rear, is brought down from the roof line. There are many historic districts that have exactly that sort of a, a, um, a requirement. The Cambridge is one, for example, where you're never permitted to put an addition on that follows the lines of the original structure. They always ask for you to change it. So that instead of having an oversized colonial that's five bays wide instead of three bays wide, you have three bay with a two bay addition, and the addition is identifiable. I, will, I think you'll find that the conventional wisdom of the, across the architectural and the preservation community is that the addition should be separate and identifiable. And so, first of all, the house, there are incremental changes to the house already that I'm sure were not original to it. Um, and that if we try to replicate the house, first of all, you've got two different axes of the house. The front goes east-west, and the back goes north-south. Which one do, do I accommodate? Do I simply go back as if the front east-west is tacked onto the back? I'm not sure I can ever get it big enough without it truly dwarfing the building. As we talk about making the building smaller, I could take two classrooms out and still leave everything else that's in that building except for the two classrooms in the hallway. It's not going to help us because I still need two stairs. I still need the lift. In the original design that we described, which was a one-story building with a lower roof. There was a cry, outcry that that was in no way fitting with the neighborhood to have a one-story structure because it would have been twice the footprint. So the two-story, which brings us the bulk, come, came from trying to get it up in the air so that it's not down on the ground. So you know, it's, it's a bit of give and take, and this is not the first design. I'm sure that we can add, and this is something I be happy to discuss with the commission, we can add more detail. We can add more windows. We can add another set of gables. We can add brackets. We can do many things to make it look more like the existing house. But, but I don't think smaller. we can replicate the house. But it won't look smaller, doing all of those things. It will only get smaller if, if, if Criterion says that they can operate a program here with fewer rooms this four classroom setting is what we build all the time for them. It is their preferred. Okay, no, I'm just asking, I'm only really asking yeah, if we're asking going to a visual question. change a visual sure. question. Will, you did all of those things. Will it get smaller? Will it look smaller? No, okay. I don't believe so. Right. That's I think it'll look more like the house. Uh, I know we can't consider color um, under our jurisdiction here, but have you given any thought to different colors to try to reduce the size of visually? Yes, and, and we typically would go one shade lighter in the addition than the color of the original house, again, to help it um, sort of, I, I believe it looks smaller. Dr. Littleton was just saying we should have, you know, we could have reversed that and made it one shade darker. Um, we, would, we would value the commission's input on that. I don't think I would do it the same color, although we have had other projects where we've been asked that the addition and the main house be exactly the same color. We do feel for the existing house that we would repaint it in the shade that it is today, even though that may or may not be historic. <coughs> okay, one of the points you made was that the, the addition is two stories versus two and a half. Um, uh, visually, however, it still looks like there's a half story there. I don't know what you've got inside, but still looks like a half story. It doesn't really look like a, like a two-story structure. It, looks, it still looks like a two and a half. Is it, so can you tell me what the significance of, of the difference is? The, we believe that the gables do dress it up. 
we fall under the definition, and I don't want to get legalese about the zoning, but um, because there isn't occupied space above the second floor, it is a two-story building. Um, we have taken the dormers off the back that we had. At one time, we had a shed dormer in the back for more head height, and we've taken that off to reduce the size of the building. So, in general, most of these houses, including the historic house, have three quarters of a story above the second floor, and we do not. Um, I, I don't know that flattening the roof or taking the gables off, I think taking the gables off the front is going to make it more objectionable, like the plainness that we've discussed in the back. Okay. okay. Well, some of you in the, in the um, uh, public commented on the fact that this was originally three lots that got combined. Can somebody like me on that? Um, well, I, we yeah. have three lots worth of I can. Okay, good. The, the lot where the historic house is, yes. where the two later smaller additions in the back, yes. and the barn. That's on the north that's, side. That's all one lot. That's all on one lot. Okay. There's another lot on the right hand side that's about the same size, maybe a little smaller. So there's one. And then there's a lot that runs okay. perpendicular to that in the back. Okay. Um, but but it, if it was, if Jack Sullivan explained to me, if it was. At one time it was a single lot, and then the stack pool broke it up into three lots, and now it's recombined into one lot. Just to be accurate, uh, historically, yeah. historically it's a single lot. <coughs> so, it's, so excuse, excuse me. Yes, I'm sorry. How does this affect the validity of these proceedings? This is a. Uh, okay. yeah. oh, oh, I don't mean to cause I don't mean to cause a problem to the member, not at no, all. I just no, you're not causing a problem. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean this to. may be your job, but it's my volunteer. I have another job. <laughs> no, 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 go right ahead. Go ahead. Give us 25 minutes for the most. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we were talking about the three lots. So, so all of the existing structures and the proposed structures are on what was originally one lot. Originally one lot. Then right. three, now one. So it's back to the original essentially. Okay, one. so if you, you, in, when you did the, the lot coverage, if you only just considered that one lot, how would it compare to the rest? Well, no, the original, I know what you're saying, you mean the one, the original lot, yes. I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, was <coughs> what, what became the three for a time. So in other words, the original, it was originally a single lot. Okay. 186 to 190. Okay. Then I guess this. You can tell us when, yes, I can answer that. When I bought the property, it was one lot. I subdivided the back lot off with the parking frenzy because the middle school was interested in purchasing it. And so at the time, I subdivided it off so I would be able to sell that back lot off to Parker Middle School. It ends up that they couldn't afford it at the time. This is when Peter Heckenbleckner was town manager. I had meetings with him. The side lot where the parking is going to be off the driveway, I subdivided that separately because I was going to build on it with my fiance. He passed away, I was taxed on it as a buildable lot, and then when I went to sell it, the town told me it wasn't a buildable lot even though they put curb cuts, water, sewer, and gas to it. So that side lot I subdivided off so I could build another home for myself and my family. When you bought the property, it was, it was all one, one lot. lot. It was all one lot. And the condition of the CPDC approval was that it returned to be one lot. 
So we haven't done any other calculation other than the coverage of the single 71,000. So the law coverage was as it was. Okay, so is it possible for you to do, to do that same calculation you did for law coverage? Is it possible for you to do the same kind of a calculation but using four area ratio as well? It, it is possible, but to yeah. what end? Because CBDC has required that it be combined and it has legally been recombined. I'm not suggesting you do anything different. Okay. I'm just saying use four area ratio is possible rather than so, Mr. Harris, I, I guess I, I guess there is no floor area ratio requirement. I didn't say there was. I'm just asking you, is it possible to do this calculation? It were absolutely possible. So, I mean, there are a number of, a number of comments that were made that, that we said <laughs> that, um, lot, that lot coverage wasn't a fair um, uh, comparison because you could, because it's a two story building where a one story building needs to be. And so, the, the calculation using ratio would take care of that. Because regardless of whether there's a FAO requirement in the building, it's still a way of looking at this in a way that, that uh, uh, would give a fair comparison. Ms. Ms. Mayaris, I, I'd like to respond because I, I don't think that's a fair comparison because when the historic house and the existing historic house in time was purchased, it was a single lot. So it, I'm not suggesting that you use anything other than the single lot. Well, that's what we used, the single the Yes, single but you, what you computed was the lot coverage. Now I'm asking to you to compute the floor area ratio instead of the lot coverage. Mm -hmm. On the single lot. Yeah. On that yeah. Oh, okay. On the single lot. I guess we can do that. Yeah, on the we single calculation. Yes. Okay, I think that would, that would address your concern. The score is going to be there. No. I understand, I understand that your proposed use is protected under the uh, under the Dover Amendment, but there aren't a lot of similar uses that would be protected under the Dover Amendment. And, um, and the structure act, when it's done, it would be unusual for it to be converted back to a use. So well, I think the, the answer to that is what would happen with any church that no longer existed or any other protected use, a school no longer used, it would fall to the normal marketplace, which would be likely to be for a similar type of use. I mean, our agency has been in existence for 17 years, you know, always been charted for early intervention. Uh, it's uh, use and mission has continued in that regard. And, and Property, you're, you're aware. Ownership of these things depends on me or anybody else. They hand down to the of directors as of the hospital or church or otherwise from generation to generation. And I would expect this service to be provided generations of services for the foreseeable future. And, and to answer your question, there's nobody has a crystal ball, right? We know that. But typically, you would expect that another similar organization, if criteria wasn't operating as 50 years ago, they would be. Uh, you would expect another similar organization to purchase it because it's set up for the use. But if you ask me, can I guarantee that? Of course not. But, but yes, yes. Excuse me. But any other use would be required to go back through the same process that we have. Exactly. It wouldn't turn into a commercial building because it wasn't this protected use. If it wasn't this but, use, it either would have to be an as of right use in the district, or it would require new approval. Um, well, I got a couple of questions uh, in, in one gap. Okay. Um, let me see if I can do this. Um, I'm, I'm worried about the preservation of the, the what I call the carriage house. Um, 
I know that the, the foundation will be showed up so it'll take the files and that weight. But it, to me, it's standing out there in very fragile condition. And I certainly would like something that would say that this thing is going to last. Because we're going to make the effort to do it sooner, Absolutely. better, whatever. Um, because it's fragile. It's very fragile, obviously. Um, so that's one area that I'm... What would you need? What would you want? Tell, help us. Because we are going to stabilize it. You know, a time frame. Um, you know. We're going to stabilize it immediately. I mean, right. the, the, the With, using, using the expertise of the, structure, of the licensed structure engineer who has been in the proper, on the property. And so we, we know that the exterior needs to remain in the appearance that it is. But we will go to repoint um, to add stabilization braces, whatever we need to do under the building to weatherize the building. There are pieces of the roof, there are pieces of windows, there are pieces of siding that are missing that we intend to immediately put back together so that there isn't any further deterioration of the structure. Has the structural engineer given you any kind of a report? Yes, so we provided that report. We'll have your report provided again. Yeah. Saving that yeah. stable. Yeah. Yeah. Carrot yeah. house. I guess. Does, and does that report say your detailed work? <coughs> that we're going to do? It does not yet. We we will we have engaged the engineer for the house and the addition, and we'll ask him to continue his work. I think I think what uh, Mac, if I, and I don't mean to tell you what you're saying, but I think what Mr. Blodgett is getting at is uh, the commission would want, and we would be more than happy to provide specifics as to how and when the barn will be stabilized so that we can be assured it's not going to fall into ruin. And, and, and that we would provide. And down the road, yes. a little bit, you know, so yes. that we can get a feeling. <coughs> Everything's going to be cared for, not neglected and involved. So, yes, so detail as to how yeah. the commission can be confident beyond our just saying it, that this is what will be done uh, within these time frames so you know that barn is there for the, the long haul. Um, okay. And I, I'll say just because of it, that I am very concerned that in three years, oh, we're not big enough. We have to have another addition. I don't know how that's going to be handled, but I just don't think. I have, I don't even know if I can get past the point of setting and bulk. Because you just said all the things there, you can paint it a little, and maybe a perception a little. You can do this to it. No, that won't change it. It's, in our word, in our, in our bylaw, it's the mass and the bulk. Those words appear repeatedly. And by saying we can't make it any smaller, just puts us right up to the wall. And I don't know what we're going to do about that. I, mean, I, I, I don't know either, but I think it's a little unfair to say, well, what about, what if you come back to us seeking another addition? I mean, we're here seeking this addition, and, right. and if we came back seeking another addition, I, I think our rights would be slim to none. But we're here seeking this addition. Well, yeah, I understand that. Not some. <coughs> that's why I put it out with. I think you're like also it. protected mm -hmm. by the CPDC. Yeah, we'd have to go back before CPDC. Any if we were to change, we'd have to add more parking, maybe more lighting, more drainage. Yeah. It would open up a whole other public yeah, hearing process with CPDC. But, it, but it's, it's a complete hypothetical, and we're not here with that. We're here with the well, I just need to get well, some assurances. I understand. The need. And there's no I have to no put it out there because if I don't hear that, it has to go to CPDC, or then I'm still yeah. locked with yeah. that question. Yeah. Totally that would answer. be a major change yeah. to the site plan. That, that's not like you're looking to change a light fixture out. That would be, right. you, you'd enter every category, drainage, uh, yeah, traffic, I, I understand that. everything. Yeah. There's yeah. no intention. Yeah, right. And you've got safeguards. <coughs> certificates that we may grant. Uh, I understand we can write conditions on them and uh, are we obliged to write conditions? Um. Well, <laughs> well, I don't know exactly to say it's fair to say you're obliged to, but certainly I would advise you to have conditions, conditions there. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you write? Yeah, of course. Go one more step and we say that there's a certificate. 
certificate of appropriateness, and let's say hypothetically we say we disapprove that, and you said immediately we'd like to go to a uh, certificate of hardship. Um, <coughs> I guess in clarification, um, do we have to re repeat this process? Does the public need input? Uh, does um, Criterion One have more input? Knowing that the circumstance, we've never had a situation, well, first of all, I've never been under a certificate of hardship request before. So if we drop uh, and you can't settle on the certificate of appropriateness, would you need additional, or do we need to have additional information in choosing about in the uh, question of the certificate of hardship? I, I think so, and I think even <coughs> more significantly, we would need, we don't want, we would need a separate hearing on the impact of the Americans with Disabilities Act and our request for a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. All right, explain to me how this is going to work then, because Request for accommodation are you thinking of this as a as, as a three-step process all you are, all you're looking for now is a, uh, a, a certificate of appropriateness and if denied then <coughs> then you will file a new application for a certificate of hardship well, and if denied you will re will request a no, no, no. We, we've already, uh, we've actually already requested all three. I would see it as a two-step. I think the hearing on the certificate of hardship, we haven't been able to necessary, and the ADA would be one. I think, I think there's no need to have two separate public hearings. Okay. And are you suggesting that the that that hearing would be newly posted? I think so. I think certainly the ADA. Although we have, I mean, if you saw the materials, I don't know if you've had a yeah, chance to see this. We, we made the request, but just just because of time and what was involved, we knew that that would be uh, uh, an issue. I don't know if it's, I guess it would have to be reposted because it wasn't mentioned in the original posting. That's that's one of my yeah. comments. So I, I think it would be probably better or safer for, for a new posting. But I'm, we're hoping we don't get there, obviously. Well, even a certificate, okay. of, well, if you do them both together. Here, here's my problem with that pro process. Okay. We are obligated to render a, a decision on your certificate of appropriateness within 60 days. 60 days, right. When is that up? Uh, April. Uh, I have it. I have it somewhere. 13th. 13th. 15th. Someday like that. Okay. Um, that triggers your appeal period. And it doesn't seem like we want to um, find ourselves in situation where we're simultaneously defending a denial of a certificate of appropriateness and also hearing you on, on the certificate of hardship. It would make more sense to me if we, we can make our decision, we can, we can write it all, we know what it is, but that, that we not issue it until, uh, if, if your certificate of appropriateness is going to be denied, not to issue it until we have had a chance to consider your, your certificate of hardship so that there ends up with a <coughs> non-comprehensive decision and not two, and forcing you to appeal one while, while pursuing the other.
this conversation about the how the procedure was going on between the lawyers, but this will allow members of the commission to um, uh, go home and, and reconvene on, on the 30th. Uh, and also, everybody in the, in the public, but I need to tell them. You want me to do that? Yeah. By the way, I have, and it's only if the only if the commission wants it, we'll call. Uh, we drafted a proposed decision. And we can uh, give it to you, but you know, obviously it's a decision uh, accepting our request for a petition about certificate of appropriateness. But uh, you'll we'll call. We definitely want that. We want that. <laughs> <laughs> we want that. Okay. <laughs> I believe there's seven. But that's, no, we haven't voted yet. Okay. So. Yeah.
I think any uh, means that you can show visually that the structure is less, I don't want to say obtrusive, less big, less, uh, reduces the mass and scale, however. If, if there are any adjustments that you can make to the stuff, good. Yeah. that will um, reduce your parent size. Or, or actual size, if they feel that yeah. they can do that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, because I think we'll that's, yeah, that's the major. Do you want to give us any guidance on the north side? <coughs> Anyone on the north side? Um, I think it's better than it was. And I, I'm, I need to say this up front, that I think your work with the Historical Commission and all of your um, efforts to make adjustments to all these things along the way is most appreciated by this board because basically it makes everybody's work easier. I still predict that the, the bulk is the problem. And I think you heard it tonight. It <coughs> is the problem. So I think anything you can do on that, both physically and observationally, <coughs> and view-wise, um, in terms of if doing a, a three-dimensional video, obviously I know what it is after hearing about it, but I'm trying to get that would work. I know somebody told me they sold their kitchen by being able to visually walk through it. Uh, I don't know that that would help. I always find them confusing, but I'm spatially uh, challenged. That's why I'm telling you. So. I'm just <laughs> challenged. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, if, you, if you could, uh, this doesn't have to be part of this proceeding, but if, if you could propose to me something that we can agree on about how uh, how this might work as a, as a two step process. You mean after tonight or right now? No, after tonight. Yeah. Oh, okay. we're done. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. No, no, you have to second the uh, no, further motion. Motion to continue. Motion to continue. Uh, uh, hearing to no. No, 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 we're going to. We're, we're Our meeting's March 30th. Yeah. Motion to continue to uh, April, April 2nd at 7 in the uh, town hall conference room. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will see you on the second.